<clears throat> we're going to start. Sure. Is it running? Yep, you're good. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, rather pressing and important topic uh, for anyone uh, who has children or those who don't have children who have grandchildren uh, and otherwise. So we're going to highlight some of the the key areas this evening uh, that we found to be important for you know, raising healthy children. That's you know raising children is something that you uh, don't go to school about. Now, there's no college there's no you know we come parents and we just sort of wing it and hope what we're doing is the right thing uh, for for our children. So you know our approach here at the clinic is you know not just you know, wait until they get sick and then try and do something about it. The approach is to try and understand why we get sick as adults, but why it's so important that what we do for our children is so critical for ultimately preventing them from uh, having uh, future health problems. So the first thing that's required for having a healthy child, uh, obviously, is a healthy parent, parents, uh, per se. The healthier the parents are, uh, the healthier the child will be. And there's now so much research in the last uh, 15 years that's suggesting that um, you know not only are you are, are children and grandchildren influenced by our health, but our great grandparents influence it, and our great grandparents and great great grandparents and great 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 great. And so, in animal studies, what we know is is that uh, the influence of uh, previous generations in animal studies goes back 80 generations. So 80 generations ago, what happened to you know in an animal study affected the offspring uh, 80 generations later. So what are we really talking about? Uh, the whole idea of healthy living is living uh, well uh, despite inescapable illnesses. People think that if you're really healthy, you should never get sick, which actually is not true. In fact, it's important that we get sick at least once a year because it's the only way we tune up our immune system uh, generally. So when you know we like to talk about you know in the clinic is you know what is what, what can be your optimal performance you know we do inherit from our parents and grandparents and great grandparents certain traits uh, the the genes themselves cannot be altered however how the genes express themselves can significantly be altered and that's really what our impact of parents is and will be on uh, on our children and eventually our grandchildren. So we're looking at how do we balance uh, everything in their life. <clears throat> so we look at you know these this little these pieces of the pie, uh, where we have you know seven different dimensions. You know people usually go to the doctor when they're looking at you know something one aspect of health, but the reality is our role as parents is to is to try and impact all seven of these areas for our children. Obviously, occupation in this case is basically as a teacher. Uh, we're teaching our children by by example. Uh, you know, the same can be said for adults. That these are the seven areas that we want to keep focusing on. The definition of health goes back to 1948 and hasn't really changed from as far as the World Health Organization is is uh, concerned. They're saying basically it's a state of, of balance on physical, mental, and social well-being. We tend to look at it a little bit differently. Uh, you know, in a, with a, in a bigger picture. Uh, because we really consider what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to have a very dynamic influence on you know, how we feel, not only today, but uh, tomorrow and next week and five years from next week. And what health is really all about is balance, uh, balance in all aspects of our life. And we know that one of the greatest challenges we have is to maintain balance. Uh, we always talk about what are the types of things that we need to do. Uh, the word homeostasis it was coined by a French physician way back in the 1800s, uh, who basically, I think that's a very important statement that he was published actually after his death. So everything that goes on in our body has but one purpose. And what that purpose is, it's to, to be able to preserve what's going on internally. So every, you know, when we get sick, when we have a, a problem in an organ, we tend to think that there's something wrong with the organ, but the reality is what the body is trying to do is try to figure out how we fix it from without having some form of an external influence. So we look at these steps to health, 
you know, down here at the bottom uh, of the picture is obviously physically recycling when we pass on. Most people who come to the clinic, most people who come to a doctor are looking for the top of the stair step. But where do they come in the process? They don't come at the, stop, at the top of the stair step hoping to stay there. They usually come well down the stair step, either with the name of a disease or a bunch of signs and symptoms. Maybe they're already in a state of dysfunction. You see they're closer to the bottom than they are to the top, which is like the proverbial, uh, you know, closing the barn door after the horse has been running out for running down the road for, for uh, you know, for quite a, a ways. So our focus is really not on people's, you know, on children, on their disease, on their signs and symptoms. Our focus is on trying to help you understand, you know, how do, how do we prevent them from becoming ill? So we know that health is this constant balancing act and among many factors. <clears throat> There's, you basically inherit your genes from, as I said, your parents and grandparents. Uh, your lifestyle are the things that you as parents will do for, for your children as what you can influence and, and how you can support them. And this new term, this epigenetics, is, is how uh, our genes are allowed to express themselves. And what we do as parents has an incredible amount of influence on that epigenetics. Uh, how we interact with our children, what we say to them, what we feed them, how we, uh, <coughs> how we take care of them will influence how our genetics basically expresses. And we can change that expression simply as parents by what it is that we do. So a healthy state is basically when all these systems are in balance. And that's really what we're about. How do we maintain these? And you know, if you look around that slide, you'll see that basically, with one exception, all of those have specialties. So if somebody has a problem in their heart, the cardiovascular, they end up going to the cardiologist. <clears throat> if somebody has problems with their nervous system, they end up going to the neurologist or the urologist, etc. However, what that does is it has no influence on the rest of your body. And it's well been known that uh, really, unfortunately, a cardiologist or any of these specialists cannot make you healthy. All I can do is make an organ system in better shape, but it doesn't have anything to do, or very little to do, with all the other organ systems, which is why we're not specialists. We basically are generalists. We're looking at everything that's going on as we're basically trying to support. The opposite side of things is, what is disease? And simply, the best definition is, it's basically a, uh, an imbalance on any level. And, and it's not just physical, by any means. And it's a continuous imbalance. It's a continuous imbalance in one or more systems. The systems that we just showed you, it only takes one system to be out of balance, to be unfortunately in a state of dis-ease, which is what we're ultimately trying to stay away from. So what do we, uh, when we look at health, when we look at uh, disease, you know, we look at lots of, you know, people always say, well, why did I get sick? Uh, and there's many, not causes, but there's many triggers as to why people get ill, but they tend to think that that's the reason that they actually got sick. <laughs> Here are probably some of the most common triggers that you know you'll see in your children, uh, and you know we see them as adults. They'll report these that when they were children, they had some of these in, these effects, some of these uh, things that affected them, and so they started you know preconception. Now they come to see us as a as an adult with some type of a health challenge, and somewhere along the line, something happened to them. It's not happenstance that we get certain illnesses. It's actually already been predetermined. It's, it's pretty well known. We pretty much know if we look at starting at pre-birth to the adult, you can predict what diseases this person will get by looking at all those other factors, <clears throat> when you sort of understand how the, how the body matures. So what we're more interested in doing in, you know, in our way of medicine <clears throat> is not looking at the leaves, not looking at the branches of the trees. You know, the, the reality is if you had a tree in your backyard and you know, some of the, the branches were dead and dying, you wouldn't call an arborist. You would just come and saw the branch off and says, now you have a healthy tree, which is kind of what the medical system is doing. It basically looks at one part. It doesn't really look at the whole, and the most important part of that tree is not above the ground. The most important part of that tree is below the ground. We call it the terrain. <clears throat> and it's what's happening down here that influences everything above the ground. And so it's the same way when we look at <coughs> our bodies. <coughs> I think that's a great slide. 
you know, we can, uh, for the germ theory, is you can vaccinate the fish, doesn't change the environment, <clears throat> or basically we can change the terrain and make the, the whole environment healthy for which uh, somebody can be healthy. So since we're looking at children, uh, for those of you who eventually would or are pregnant, you know, there's a number of things that, that are done and should be done uh, for children. The most important aspect for, in pregnancy is what does the mom eat? And now, of course, this, is, this should start before she's actually pregnant. But the reality is food becomes absolutely essential. And whether it's pregnancy or our children or grandchildren or whomever, if, you know, like we call that a whole food diet. So you look at the food and you say, I can name it. So if you can name it, you can eat it. If you can't name it, you probably shouldn't be eating it. And that means it's not coming out of a box or a can because you don't really know what's in there. You can read the, the ingredients on the label. But whole foods is without any doubt the, the, the most sound diet for anybody. <clears throat> and then when once a mom is pregnant, she has certain you know, specific needs, whether it's extra iron, whether it's extra folate, B vitamins, proteins as the baby is growing. We can't forget that mom also needs to be moving. It's just as important that when mom is pregnant that she, don't really, she doesn't really change her activities, but she keeps doing what she's doing. And if she's doing, has done yoga and tai chi or qigong, which are excellent activities for pregnant moms, or you know, it's, whether it's just walking. Obviously, she's not going to be jogging well into her pregnancy, but she certainly does need to keep moving. And she does need additional support. Uh, pregnancy, there's, a, there's another uh, live being growing inside, and mom needs more support, but not only does mom need the support, we're actually providing it for the baby, and what is provided for the infant, for the fetus, is extremely important in the future development uh, of the child themselves. So if we look at, you know, now the baby is born, you know, what are the areas that we need to keep focusing on uh, as parents? Our future parents, um, and what's coming to the fore is what's happening in our digestive tract. And th there's, it's so critical what happens early on, both in mom during pregnancy and these first several years, and then ongoing. As we'll see, this is now becoming potentially one of the most important areas of health itself. In fact, it's, it's to the point where we're going to call the human microbiome its own organ because it does so many things. People don't tend to think that the bugs in our digestive system are an organ, but they do so many different properties, which is why one of the things we're going to recommend is taking probiotics is going to be one of the most essential things you're going to need to do for your children and for yourself. So this microbiome, which is a fancy name, which are all the old bugs that live in our digestive system, and depending on our size, they weigh between two and four pounds. We have two or four pounds of bacteria living in our, inside our digestive system. Those, or those bacteria are greatly influenced by what happens during mom's pregnancy, the nature of the birth, what happens after birth, what, what types of things the child is exposed to, and whether a baby is born vaginally or whether it's born and is, and is breastfed, whether it's born vaginally and bottle fed, whether it's born by C-section, the flora that eventually matures in that child is very different. And that will influence greatly uh, over time, um, you know, what types of conditions, what type of health uh, the, the child will have. So when a baby is born, they basically are sterile. They don't have any bugs in their gut. So the first bugs in the gut come from the immediate environment. So if they're born vaginally, they'll first bugs are what's in the vaginal canal. If they're born by C-section, it's the bugs that are in the operating room, so which are generally not the most hospitable. And the flora of a C-section baby is very different from the flora of a vaginal birth baby. And it's been well known that vaginal birth babies have a very different flora. So there's lots of things that ultimately influence over the first few months until we get into adults. You have your adult flora somewhere between three, four years of age. After three or four, so what happens in those first three or four years pretty much determines what the nature of your 2,000 or so bugs are. 
uh, that you have within a variety of things. There's, excuse me, there's 2,000 different bugs of which you have four or 500. And another person will have four or 500 different ones, uh, generally. <clears throat> Which also influences your flora is what we feed them. What we feed children ultimately has a great impact on their flora. And as we age, our flora changes. And so one of the things we don't know yet why, but about age 50, the flora changes. We don't know why. But the flora is so critical for our immune system it's the assumption is it's one of the reasons that people over 50 have more diseases. It's why they have more incidence of cancer. Say, well, maybe it's just an aging process. An aging process is part of it, but it doesn't have to be part of it. And then all of it starts as young as possible. So when we look, when we're trying to raise healthy children, we're looking at you know a variety of different objectives. So we're going to touch on all these types of things. Diet becomes critical for uh, children, what level of activity are they doing, their oral hygiene, their general hygiene, and then what kind of minimal support is reasonable for, for a child. <clears throat> so we definitely want to promote a healthy relationship with, with food for children. It's the you know, children born nowadays are you know, in a very different world than children who were born you know, before 1959 when the first McDonald's was basically came on the market. It wasn't, you know, fast food uh, back, you know, 50 years ago, <laughs> generally speaking. And since the average adult uh, eats 17 of 21 meals away from the home, it puts children in much the same scenario. And you say, well, what are they actually eating? As we'll see, there's an important statistic. So finding, you know, the best food choices for children uh, is an important aspect to helping them, you know, become as healthy as possible. In some cases, uh, there can be at-home allergy testing done, just with a finger prick. Uh, and, and we can also do an office type test uh, to determine whether there's specific foods. Unfortunately, we know that the school environment may not be the healthiest choices uh, that children are exposed to. Uh, you know, food that's sold in, in uh, vending machines may not provide the best choice for children, yet that's what they like because it's, it's mostly fat. It's mostly sugar, and it tastes good. So that's why kids will eat it. And parents are often sort of put into the corner, well, they won't eat vegetables, so therefore I'll feed them. They'll eat something. So I'll give them mac and cheese. Well, I'll guarantee you they'll eat vegetables if they don't have anything else to eat because they won't starve to death. They may not eat for two days, but they still won't starve to death uh, is the reality. <laughs> so, you know, there's a we know in society that the typical diet is unfortunately unhealthy, unhealthy fats, uh, sugar, and salt. And that's the reality. That's the reality of you know where many uh, children in our society are actually getting their food. Fast food is on every corner. Uh, you know the portion sizes have significantly increased. If they, if you look at portion sizes of even of the fast food restaurants, you know before they went to the double your thing and get the big size, super size, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what ended up, what ultimately ended up happening is that the sizes get bigger and bigger, and when they compared them over the years, for no particular reason, they just have. Uh, and of course, there's unfortunately an adequate number of different colors of foods that. that are, and what's that resulting in? That 50 to 70 percent of overweight children, unfortunately, become overweight adults, and which is a, an unfortunate statistic. I think this is an important statistic over time for as far as raising healthy children. There's been enough studies that show that when you sit down to dinner, and children sit down to dinner, ultimately, they, over time, over decades, um, they become much healthier in general, usually because of food choices are healthier choices. So eating with your family becomes an incredibly important uh, component uh, when raising your children. And these are the, you know, your typical types of conditions that we end up seeing as the end result of less than ideal uh, nutrition. Nutrition is a key component, but so is physical activity. Children do a lot of their learning by play. It's not, you know, you play games, you learn rules of games, you learn how to interact with other children, you learn how to be social, etc. cetera. Uh, as we'll see, working, being on digital devices is really not very intellectual way for raising children. So, and 
physical activity, unfortunately, has significantly decreased. Uh, physical activity will significantly increase uh, motor skills, you know, how, how coordinated children can get. It's, not, it's essential. It's essential that adults move every day, but it's even more essential that kids move every day. Uh, and so they learn these basic skills. They also learn how to, be, to develop confidence in what they're doing, self-esteem, etc. But it's also important to remember that when kids do activity, they, they have a very different uh, interaction physiologically. So they tend to get much more overheated much more quickly. Uh, they basically sweat less because they don't have as large a body area. Uh, they get overheated. They get a lot colder a lot quicker uh, than adults do. And that's an important uh, activity to realize, especially here in Arizona where it is so hot in the summertime and that tragedy last weekend with that 12-year-old got overheated and unfortunately passed away. Uh, you know, they, you don't tend to realize that the adult can sort of carry through, but children are not able to do that. So, of course, what's, what's, you hear it all the time, you need a drink. So, five to eight ounces for every 20 minutes. And the, for a teenager, they have to be more than that. And what are they supposed to drink? Just straight water. And, of course, that's not what they're drinking. And if they've been raised drinking water, then it won't be a problem. Uh, so we're suggesting that they don't drink what everybody else is suggesting. In fact, these types of drinks will further dehydrate you uh, more quickly. So whether it's soda or an energy drink, or I need more energy. You actually want to stay away from that because more because of the additives. It comes back to just straight plain water is really what we uh, want to be uh, you know, having our children drink. <clears throat> Unfortunately, physical education in some schools is no longer part of the, I know when we were at school, we used to have recess in the morning and recess in the afternoon. They used to have gym class sometimes every day, sometimes uh, three times a week. A lot of that has been removed because of a cost cutting type thing. So, you know, th there's something to be said. It's not just about uh, activity, but it was, a, it was an opportunity through all through school that many children, and of course we have more and more homeschool school children who don't have that opportunity either. A really big issue is this one. This is an ongoing issue is how much screen time are kids, you know, being allowed to play. You know, so those pictures with those little babies and this little kid here with this with this iPhone, uh, this is not healthy. This is extremely unhealthy. In fact, in Europe kids are not allowed to have cell phones until they're 18 uh, because of the fact of the radiation that comes from it. And the main reason is, is if they hold it to their ear, the radiation actually goes through their entire skull. An adult, where the, where it's, the, the skull is thicker, it only penetrates partially. But it's, there's, there's good studies to show that, that, which is why in Europe they're basically your band uh, to do that, generally. And we know, unfortunately, you know, watching television, looking at these types of things. So it has been recommending, under age two, that a child never be shown the television. Uh, and it's recommended that you know two hours a day is the maximum for all children and all these devices, no matter what age. <laughs> so we have fast food environment. We have a lot of technology. And where do kids learn a lot of their behaviors? by seeing these types of things on, on, on a big screen TV, by sitting in front of a computer playing a game, by playing you know video games and that type of stuff, or sitting on cell phones. This, are they a necessity on some level? But are they a problem as far as health? A huge problem. And we'll find that in the next generation, in the next generation, it will become even more of a problem, uh, generally because younger and younger children are being exposed to this type of electromagnetic radiation. Something that, you know, as a former dentist, uh, it's a, obviously it's an incredibly important component. A good dental hygiene starts with the first breastfeeding, or the first feeding. So children should have their mouth cleaned, babies should have their mouth cleaned, after every time they're fed, whatever it is that they're being fed. Uh, Obviously, we have you know a toothbrush at some point. Uh, with babies, you just simply wipe the gum pad with your finger, and what you're doing is you're just stimulating uh, the gums themselves. 
the, the best way, when should you start brushing a child's teeth? When the first tooth comes in, which is six months, more or less. So you don't use toothpaste because you don't need toothpaste. You just need the action of the brush. Uh, and a lot of people don't start brushing their kids' teeth until they're two or three when they have all their teeth. And of course, then the kid fights because I don't want to. I don't want to let you brush my teeth. So if you start literally at six months, and even earlier just with your finger, the child won't uh, basically balk at that. And the best way to brush a baby's teeth, tooth, teeth is to sit down on a chair with your knees up, and you basically flop the baby that way with their head down there. And when they do that, their head automatically goes back and their mouth opens. And it's real easy to get in and brush your teeth. When you start off doing that real young, they'll never resist. Um, I believe you should brush, uh, you know, your children's teeth until they're about, they're about five, because they really don't have the manual dexterity in order to do that. They should also have their first visit to the dentist between two and three, even if it's just a ride on the chair, do nothing else, just that. Uh, you know, just to get used to going into that office, to you know, having to sit here to do that type of thing. Uh, obviously, like adults, they should have regular checkups, and you know, what they're being fed is is going to be an important component of this. So, dental hygiene, oral hygiene, but also uh, just you know, washing your hands. You know, we take it for granted that when you know, kids, you know, in daycare, they, they stick their finger in somebody else's mouth and they stick it in their eye and their ear and, you know, you've got all those types of things. It's certainly a way that, uh, that you know, organisms get transferred. Now, it's not terrible to do that. <clears throat> However, depending on what else is going on with the child, may have a very significant influence on, you know, on their health, et cetera. Et cetera. So, we've talked about, you know, the diet, the activity, Hygiene, oral hygiene, and I think you know, should your the baby to your teenager, you know, take supplements. In this society, you know, my answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there's four that I'm going to talk about that I think are really the the foundation uh, for uh, a supplement regime. And there's not just now there's no doubt about it that probiotics. If, if, if somebody, if you're going to give one thing to your child, it should be a probiotic. There's so much research that has now come out in the last five years even on, on the benefit of, of this, uh, including, as adults, how it influences mental health. We see so many challenges with, with you know, grade schoolers, bullying in high school, et cetera, the challenges of mental health. We now can, can relate it to probiotics. In fact, the psychiatrists have, have renamed it psychobiotics. They're just probiotics. They're the same thing as these. But because they're being used by psychiatrists, they're basically finding that the, the aspect of the probiotic uh, is so critical for what's going on in the digestive system. Uh, we now know that one of the greatest influences on obesity is probiotics. There's actual specific types of organisms, specific types of bugs that will have an impact on obesity. So that goes back to childhood. So there's so many benefits of taking a probiotic that it goes without saying that, in my opinion, this is the one supplement, if there is to be just one. It's 50 times, 1,000 times more important than a multivitamin, which everybody just talks about. But it's really, it's probiotics. probiotics will have an influence on, the, on your health for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Another one that comes, especially as we grow up, is the importance of omega-3 oils. Fish oil, we're saying in this case, but it could be flax oil, it could be hemp oil, uh, you know, it could be other types of EFAs. Most people will use a super EFA uh, as, as a fish oil. <clears throat> in children and influence, they're actually using this DHA. And so fish oils is made up of two types of oils called EPA and DHA, <clears throat> and when you look at that, DHA is specifically for the brain. Uh, the other EFAs, the EPAs, is more specifically for cardiovascular inflammation, inflammatory disease. So the super EFA has the combination of both, but for children, 
this is the one that we recommend is DHA. In fact, I recommend that the baby start getting a drop of DHA the day they're born. And you just slowly increase the dosage till they're one and two. And then by the time they're two to three, we basically switch it over to a combination of both of these. So both for children and adults as the parents, uh, fish oil has so many positive studies that have been done for it. And of course now you see that Alzheimer's um, is, is up on the top here for dementia as, as an important, uh, important component. So like probiotics, fish oil has so many, you know, listed there, 10 uh, of, of benefits of taking fish oil. Obviously if you're allergic to fish, not a good choice. Uh, but there is other choices. So we can use flax oil and hemp oil and, and other types of things. So in other words, we're looking at healthy fats uh, that have such a huge influence on our, our, on our system. Uh, a supplement that is probably not familiar with most people is this specific one, which is an algae supplement. It's blue-green algae. Affigen is a specific brand that we use. And it's basic, algae is a complete food. It's a complete organism. Everything in that capsule is there to sustain life, which is what algae does. Algae literally sustains life. And I, to me, this is what I would much prefer people take instead of a multivitamin, because it really supplies everything that you ever would require for life, much more than a multivitamin that is a sort of a hit and miss based on the supplement company that's general. And the reason that this one is so important is that this was the first living organism on the planet four billion years ago. Assumption is the Earth's been here for five billion, but four billion years ago this was the first plant. Every other plant has evolved from blue-green algae. Uh, so it is literally the original, the, the most original component on, that has ever been on this planet and it has survived four billion years, unlike many other uh, plants in much more important than vitamins are minerals. Vitamins are relatively easy to absorb. Minerals are much more difficult. They come in various forms. For the younger ones, the trace minerals, or we have colloidal minerals, we have the water, or even uh, the, uh, the capsules uh, of the multimins. So if, if one's needing support in there, then minerals, once again, are, I think, more important than uh, the aspect of uh, a vitamin. How do we support uh, you know, a child's developing immune system? We talked about you know, the, this whole idea of being in a state of balance. You know, if we look, you know, if we dissected the immune system out generally, you know, these are the parts of the immune system, but the reality is made up of much more than that. So in a person who is ill, uh, they always say, oh, I have a weak immune system. Or somebody who has an autoimmune disease, they say, I have an overactive immune system. Much more appropriate than that is simply to say, the system is not in balance. And the jo our job as the physician is to try and get it back in balance. So we say, you know, why do kids get sick? You know, why does your child, why, is, I just read it the other day, how many school days were lost every school year in this country? It's millions for sickness, for illness. Now, kids are supposed to get sick. <clears throat> so the, the bottom uh, four reasons are the most common reason that children get sick. Microbes, toxicity, stress, which we don't tend to think about kids under stress, and then lifestyle. The lack of exercise, lack of sleep, as we'll see how critical that is. Uh, you know, and then, yes, there's some other things which we tend to see more in adults, but these, and num number six is the one that, you know, people are always saying, oh, it's, you know, my child's in daycare, or they went to school, and that kind of exposure. They're supposed to be exposed, as we'll see. <laughs> so in the 60s, you know, the whole idea that, you know, it, you know people got sick by so-called hot diseases or infectious diseases where they had a fever. <clears throat> now people get sick, including children, <coughs> with so-called cold diseases. Uh, things like asthma, allergies, cancer even in young children, unfortunately, mental, emotional, neurological issues that are going on. Uh, but inflammation is not, is not really an illness. Uh, 
inflammation is a sign that there's something that's out of balance and the immune system is, needs to be in balance. So should kids get sick? Yes, they should. In the first year, the average, the first few years, the average child should be sick four to six times. That is actually how they, they grow an immune system. The thing you don't want to do is you don't want to really then give them something, which is a natural instinct. Oh, my child is uncomfortable. Uh, we need to, need to do something about that. The reality is, is that these, this is a common type thing. And one of the big challenges for parents is when their baby, toddler, child gets a fever. What should I do? Should we lower the fever? And why do we have a fever in the first place? Well, the main reason we have a fever is because that is the best antibiotic there is. There is no better antibiotic than a fever. The higher the fever, the better. But of course, parents get very concerned about that. And the doctors get concerned about that because they say, well, if you have a really high fever, you may have a febrile seizure. And it's true. There are many children who have a febrile seizure. If you're having febrile seizures, stop about age five for specific reasons. Uh, but having a febrile seizure in no way predicts that somebody has epilepsy. Uh, all it means is, is that they have a rapid rise of their temperature because they have an infection somewhere. Often the parent is then told, don't ever let your child have a fever. There's, there's good research that shows that children who have had febrile seizures have a higher IQ. So if you want your kid to be smarter, let them have febrile seizures. And they'll actually be smarter overall. You know, the seizure itself, to witness it, is very scary for people. So what do you do when a child has a fever? Instead of giving them Tylenol to lower it, which basically just prolongs the, prolongs the illness, you just put them in a the bathtub. Tepid bath is the best way for a child, or an alcohol sponge bath. They're the two best ways to deal with when a child has a fever. And we, as the parent, of course, feel... Oh, they, but they're uncomfortable, they're sore, because we know what happens when we have a fever. It's like we're sore, we're achy. There's, that's a physiologic reason. But um, you will do much more for their immune system by letting their immune system do what it's naturally supposed to be doing, and that's to have a fever. <clears throat> so let them have a fever. Um, you know, normally, how high can you let it go? Usually 105.5 is sort of the cutoff. Uh, and then a healthy child, healthy meaning that they're not having some other types of issues, you know, they're, they don't already have some issues, uh, the, the temperature won't go above that. But, you know, if 103 is where somebody is comfortable, put them in the bathtub at 103. And it'll drop it down two or three degrees. A few hours later, it'll be back up again. Put them back in the bathtub. Over 24 hours, you have done more for the immune system than any medication could ever do. Through for the school year, that slide didn't come out right, uh, we basically recommend this is an alternative to so-called the flu shot, which, uh, you know, we basically, this is a homeopathic remedy. It's a little tablet. There's 10 or 12 in there. You take, give your child one of these every two weeks, starting mid-October until April or so as basically as a general support for the flu. And it's very effective. It's widely used, and that particular product comes out of Europe, and it's pretty effective. So what do you do if your child is sick? The most important thing that they do is, is they get lots of water. Not just not, not drinks and that kind of stuff, but fluids. <clears throat> you have to increase their probiotics. We're trying to upregulate their immune system through their natural immune system. Uh, instead of doing one of the mucoproxinum um, every two weeks, we did twice a day for three days. Uh, we use a variety of hydrotherapy. I said bass is one thing. We can do socks on their feet. Uh, we can do heated compresses on their throat. We can do you know, cold cloth, that type of thing. Uh, the suggestion is, is that we would only consider antibiotics if there was as an absolute last resort. But of course, we have so many alternatives that it's really, in all honesty, I've never really had a need to give an antibiotic to a child almost no matter what their problem was. <clears throat> so and if necessary, if, you know, you can come into the clinic and see Dr. Maxim or Dr. Droba who can give you an individual uh, protocol. This is an, an important statistic that hopefully will emphasize why antibiotics are so devastating. 
this was a study done of a seven-day course of an antibiotic. Uh, it's on there somewhere. Um, and two years later, the flora had not returned to the pre-taking the antibiotic. And since flora is really what our, is a huge component of our immune system, if you just think of a child getting antibiotics for ear infection, you know, three or four times over the course of 18 months, what has happened to their flora? What's going to happen to them as they age? It has a huge impact. What happens at a six-year-old if you give it that? And it takes two years for it to start to come back to normal. And, and this is trying to support their system. So that's why we say only as a last resort. Sleep. Sleep is essential. This, I just got this information yesterday. It was just published. This is the number of hours that kids require as far as sleep is concerned. At 12 to 16 hours for under 1, 11 to 14 for 1 to 2, 10 to 13. Uh, and you look at your teens, 8 to 10. Now, it's not just about sleeping 8 to 10. For a teenager, going to bed at 3 in the morning and sleeping till noon is not physiologically a good idea because we're also looking at biochemistry. We're also looking at hormone levels and that type of thing. There's absolutely a best time to go to sleep, as we'll see, for, uh, for all ages, for us as adults also. We know that kids are sleep deprived, which means parents are sleep deprived. It's sort of expected when you have a little baby, uh, you know, that you'll become sleep deprived. And then for parents who've had, you know, have had a baby, the baby's starting to sleep tonight, and now they're pregnant, and now they have another baby. So that we have some parents who are spending five or six years of never getting a full night's sleep. It takes years for that to from a physiologic perspective. So what, are the, what is the most critical thing as far as sleep is concerned? Is that they sleep in total darkness. They, there was not a light inside this uterus. When they came out, they said, oh my god, what, are, what, are, what is this? The Pavarotti arrived? I'm like, what happened? Where does light come from? <clears throat> so kids should sleep in the dark. Where's the best place for a baby to sleep? Unfortunately, not in mom's bed. It's in the closet. Pitch black. It's where they came from. That's what they expect. Bassinet, where they can feel the sides. Now, in addition to that, of course, on the other side of it is we need daylight. So sleep in pitch black, and then in the day daytime, we get exposed to, ideally, daily sunshine. A lot of people you know, online don't live in a part of the country where you have sunshine in the middle of winter. Not every day, anyway, unlike Arizona. These two things, dark and light, have such a huge impact on affecting hormone balance. As simple as it is, dark, white, dark, white, has a huge impact on getting um, cycles. And so for a, a mom who is pregnant and is trying to get back into having a regular menses, one of the best ways to do it is sleep in the pitch black, get light, and it'll start to help regulate the cycle again. Just that. <clears throat> we know that any light, so people say, well, what if they wake up if there's a night light? You get used to the idea that it's pitch black. Pitch black that if you hold your hand there, you can see your hand. That really is how dark it should be for the ideal functioning of a child. We know that sleep-deprived children are much more accident-prone, just generally speaking. There's so many more injuries in adults and in children who don't get enough uh, sleep. <clears throat> we also look at parents, you know, the aspect of parental stress. Uh, you know, as, as you know, it's it's a huge job raising children, as we know. And I said, there is no college course telling us what we should do or shouldn't do. So we know that uh, children are particularly affected by stress, and we don't tend to appreciate that. Uh, however, when we do simple measurements here in the clinic, it's pretty easy to see that a child can be as easily just as stressed as an adult is without realizing it, because they either can't express it. They're not manifesting symptoms necessarily. We also know that when the cortisol levels are off, that there's much more likelihood towards attention deficit. So we have many children in some states 
you know, half the class is on some form of a medication for that. And, it's, and so for some of those children, not all, some of those children, it will simply come down to balancing their hormones, specifically cortisol. <clears throat> we know that one of the best things we can do for our kids is cuddle. It has a huge impact on their life later on. Uh, the, some of the original stories for these came from the Romanian orphans 25 years ago when those babies, unfortunately, weren't even touched. They often, they, they weren't even held to, to be fed a bottle. They were just sort of put a bottle in their, in their crib. They had to figure out how to get the milk out of it, generally. So those children, which grew up basically totally without any type of human touch, had significant, have significant mental emotional issues. So we have all these factors that we need to try and influence uh, for us parents, for our children. <clears throat> and in the clinic, we have three simple tests that we can get some information, whether you know your child is having any challenges or whether or not they could do some challenges. One is simply doing a, a bioimpedance analysis. And what we're looking at is simply body proportion. You know, are they, is the amount of muscle mass that they have appropriate for their age? Is their percent body fat appropriate for their age? Uh, are they properly hydrated? Very simple test, like a scale, you stand on it for three minutes, hold on to the, uh, the two bars, and you get that information, which, which is a great baseline to give for children to know where they're, 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 they are. <clears throat> As I said a minute ago, it's, it's surprising how many children that we don't realize are living under incredible amount of stress uh, because instead they can't express it. So simply by putting you know a Nature V on their finger, we can measure how much stress that they're under and whether their their, their organ systems or nervous system is in a place of proper balance. There are these two parts of the nervous system: the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, and they basically work like a, a teeter totter. When one's up, the other one's down. And what we're finding is more and more children are living in this one, which is the flight fright part of it, as opposed to the rest, relax, heal. So children should be spending more time over there. The ideal is 60-40 for an adult. It's more like 90-10 for an adult. But often a child can be in the very same uh, scenario. Simple test to see the, our, our organs out of balance is, is a Zyto scan. How uh, it simply is a function of you know putting your hand on a cradle uh, using a computer. We can we can get a scan, look at a whole bunch of different organs and see if the organs are in fact in balance or if they're out of balance. And if they're out of balance, and our job is to try and figure out you know why is it out of balance and what are we going to do about it. <clears throat> so what do children need? They need to be touched. They need to be loved. They need to be spoken to kindly. Uh, they need to be. I heard a statistic at one point, by the time a child is four years of age, they have been told 350,000 times a negative comment. No, sit down, be quiet, wait, it's not your turn, please, it's get in line, do this, do that. Negative feedback. Those first four years are so critical in forming a child's perceptions. Uh, you know, so what we say to our children, how we say it, has a huge role, ultimately, as they grow up into adults, uh, what, will, and, you know, what they will become. Having them in a routine, giving them whole foods, uh, using the supplements, that I believe, as aphogen, as a blue-green algae, a whole food, the importance of supporting brain development in the younger ones, and then brain and muscle skeletal development in, in you know, children who are in school. And then the number one thing, as I said, is, is the probiotics, which is absolutely so critical for what's going on. <clears throat> so there, we know that there's so much that we can do for children. What we prefer not to do is to wait for them to be sick. If we wait for them to be sick, we're sort of chasing them, so running after the horse. It's sort of where the you know the doors went open, and we're running down the road, uh, generally speaking. So our role as parents, therefore, is pretty critical. And what we do, the types of choices that we give our kids, uh, what it is that they need to do for themselves and, and as we train. And what, what we offer our children is what becomes their learned perceptions. You know, how they enter the world is basically learned from what they see their parents doing and their, you know, their immediate family doing. <laughs> 
So what we do for our children will have a huge impact on them later on uh, in life. So you obviously need to treat children with great respect and forethought. The goal is is that you know one day they're going to have to look after you, perhaps uh, per se. So let's if we raise them well, and we're still around at 90 and 100 years old. Uh, they're going to be helping us, you know, look after them, look after ourselves. <laughs> so we need a baseline. So you know, we can do a baseline. Uh, you know, once again, with seeing Dr. Maxim or, or Dr. Gilbot, if the child is a little older, uh, I believe that there's, it's never too young to find a baseline just for some simple blood tests, you know, just a, a CBC. Because I always feel you have to start somewhere. You don't know, once again wait until they're sick until you start looking for something. Let's find out where the baseline is. Certainly the, the three tests, the viral impedance, HRV, and the Zytoscan, you have a pretty good foundation from which to build on for any child. <clears throat> you know, and if a child is in a good place of balance and a good place of homeostasis, uh, minimally, uh, they should be taking those four things. Probiotic, as I suggested, uh, some form of an omega-3 uh, oil, uh, minerals preferably, and then aphogen. So this evening, uh, as a result of you know these types of things, you know the clinic will obviously have an opportunity to offer a special. Uh, so for the next week or so, uh, any of the any of the things that we talked about would have a special. There also is a special as far as the consultation is concerned, whether it's a child or an adult. You know, 50% discount on that. Uh, there is these coupons that, that are available. Uh, you can schedule a consult with uh, Dr. Drobot or Dr. Maxim. Uh, once again, we, there's a coupon uh, for, for, for what's going on there. I don't know why that's a blank slide. <clears throat> so at this point, we can say, are there any questions? And maybe there are some online, if somebody wants to type any questions in online. <clears throat> Do you have any questions in here? Uh, there's no disease. There's only there's a very small percentage of diseases that are hereditary, and those are specifically there are gene defects like Down syndrome, for example, is a common cystic fibrosis. There's an actual defect in the genes per se. All these other ones we now are actually they're it's called epigenetics. It's the environment with which one's raised, which predisposes one towards dementia. We say, well, if your mother or grandmother at an early age had dementia, then there's a higher likelihood. Well, what are you actually taking on as you're taking on all the influence that you had from your parents and all the things they did, you probably do the same thing. A lot of the foods that you like are probably because your parents liked them. A lot of the activities that you did are probably because your parents did them. Those are the things that are sort of predisposing people towards you know, some other type of an illness like that. So we now know that there's no incurable illnesses. Every illness can be cured. There are some patients that can't be cured, but the, il the illness itself can be cured because we actually know enough about physiology and how the body works to be able to do that. So there's no such thing as an incurable disease anymore. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea. The whole idea is to be proactive. The whole idea is not to wait until you, you go to a doctor and he says, oh, so you have disease X, Y, Z. What do I do about it? The whole idea is to say, where's my balance? Where am I starting from? Let's work from there because we already know. There's a lot more we need to know, but we already know a lot about disease. What we don't seem to want to focus on is health. We don't want to focus on, well, we, if you have these types of things, we even say cancer. People say, what causes cancer? Maybe people go, yes, the oncologist, they go, we don't know. Well, actually, we do know. We know that 60% of cancer is related to the food people eat. It's, there's no, just no doubt about it. I mean, it's so equivocal. We know that environmental things. Some of the things we don't have much influence over, but we can certainly influence our diet. We can certainly influence the amount of activity that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We can certainly influence, for our children and ourselves, our sleep patterns. We can certainly influence our type of routine. 
you know, the types of things that we do for ourselves on an everyday. We can certainly influence ourselves by drinking water, mostly, and then some other beverages occasionally, but generally making water. So very simple things. We already know well, are, is very proactive. And, you know, we live in a society, and we're a bit spoiled in, in our clinic here because most people who come here have that awareness, so I need to drink water. But yet there's lots of children who don't drink water. I don't like the taste of water, so they drink juice, which is the worst possible thing you could ever give a child. Juice is, to me, is one of the worst things. As a dentist, without any doubt, a child should never have juice, in my biased opinion. So yes, you can influence and you can be proactive, no matter what cards you've been dealt. Well, you can't change, well, that's not true. I was going to say you can't change the color of your hair. Actually, it's pretty easy. It's called hair dye. <laughs> But theoretically, without using something external, you can't change it. <laughs> and with plastic surgery, you can change anything almost. But theoretically, uh, we you know we can't change you know the color of your skin as what your color of your skin is, the color of your eyes with the color of your eyes, you know that type of thing. So, but we can certainly modify you know what happens to us as we age, definitely. And we can have a huge influence on our children uh, as they age and what they will become as adults, for sure. Anything else? All right. Well, I hope this was of some benefit. Um, you will be able to, for those of you who are online, uh, you'll be able to, this will get um, posted on our website or somewhere, right? Yes. <laughs> on the website. Uh, so you'll be able to look at, and, and look at it, and we would encourage you to, um, you know, have your colleagues. Now, those of you who are in groups with toddlers and uh, other moms, uh, probably it wouldn't be a bad idea for them to, uh, to have a, a gander at this because ultimately it can have a huge impact uh, on, on, on your family and on your children's health. So thanks for coming. It's much appreciated. Thank you. All right. All right. We're going to shut it down.